Welcome to Flourish. I'm Diane Planadan, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create an inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development. So we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor. We are still in week six of the program. So let's get started with language. Language and language use. Humans have the capacity to use complex language far more than any other species on Earth. We cooperate with each other to use language for communication. Language is often used to communicate about and even construct and maintain our social world. Language use and human sociality are inseparable parts of the Homo sapiens as biological species. The learning objectives for this chapter is define basic terms used to describe language use, describe the process by which people can share new information by using language, characterize the typical content of conversation and its social implications, characterize psychological consequences of language use, and give an example. As usual, this is open courseware, and it's available readily on the internet. I just give you these learning objectives as that's part of the introduction to this chapter. I'm a student, I'm not a teacher. So we are learning together. Imagine two men of 30 something age, Adam and Ben, walking down the corridor. Judging from their clothing, they are young businessmen taking a break from their work. They then have this exchange. Adam, you know Gary bought a ring. Ben, oh yeah, for Mary, isn't it? Adam nods. If you are <laughs> watching this scene and hearing this conversation, what you can guess from this. First of all, you'd guess that Gary bought a ring for Mary, whoever Gary and Mary might be. Perhaps you would infer that Gary is getting married to Mary. What else can you guess? Perhaps that Adam and Ben are fairly close colleagues and both of them know Gary and Mary reasonably well. In other words, you can guess the social relationships surrounding the people who are engaging in the conversation and the people whom they are talking about. Language is used in our everyday lives. If psychology is a science of behavior, scientific investigation of language use must be one of the most central topics. This is because language use is ubiquitous. Every human group has a language, human infants, except for those who have unfortunately been born with disabilities. Learn at least one language without being taught explicitly. Even when children who don't have much language to begin with are brought together, they can begin to develop and use their own language. There is at least one known instance where children who had little language were brought together and developed their own language spontaneously with minimum input from adults. In Nicaragua in the 1980s, deaf children who were separately raised in various locations were brought together to schools for the first time. Teachers tried to teach them Spanish with little success. However, they began to notice that the children were using their hands and gestures apparently, to communicate with each other. Linguists were brought in to find out what was happening. It turned out the children had developed their own sign language by themselves. That was the birth of a new language, Nicaraguan sign language. Language is ubiquitous, and we humans are born to use it. Well, at least they didn't start speaking Klingon. <laughs> How do we use language? If language is so ubiquitous, how do we actually use it? To be sure, some of us use it to write diaries and poetry, but the primary form of language use is interpersonal. That's how we learn language, and that's how we use it. Just like Adam and Ben, we exchange words and utterances to communicate with each other. Let's consider the simplest case of two people, Adam and Ben, talking with each other. According to Clark, in order for them to carry out a conversation, they must keep track of common ground. Common ground is a set of knowledge that the speaker and listener share, and they think, assume, or otherwise take for granted that they share. So when Adam says, Gary bought a ring, he takes for granted that Ben knows the meaning of the words he is using, whom Gary is, and what buying a ring means. When Ben says, for Mary, isn't it? He takes for granted that Adam knows the meaning of these words who Mary is, and what buying a ring for someone means. All these are part of their common ground. 
Note that when Adam presents the information about Gary's purchase of a ring, Ben responds by presenting his inference about who the recipient of the ring might be, namely Mary. In conversational terms, Ben's utterance acts as evidence for his comprehension of Adam's utterance. Yes, I understood that Gary bought a ring. And Adam's nod acts as evidence that he now has understood what Ben has said too. Yes, I understood that you understood that Gary has bought a ring for Mary. <laughs> this new information is now added to the initial common ground. Thus, the pair of utterances by Adam and Ben, called an adjacentary pair, together with Adam's aff affirmative nod, jointly completes one proposition. Gary bought a ring for Mary and adds this information to their common ground. This way, common ground changes as we talk, gathering new information that we agree on, and having evidence that we share. It evolves as people take turns to assume the role of speaker and listener and actively engage in the exchange of meaning. Sometimes the uh, gossip can be a little dangerous though, right? <laughs> Common ground helps people coordinate their language use. For instance, when a speaker says something to a listener, he or she takes into account their common ground. That is what the speaker thinks the listener knows. Adam said what he did because he knew Ben would know who Gary was. He'd have said, a friend of mine is getting married to another colleague who wouldn't know Gary. This is called audience design. Speakers design their utterances for their audiences by taking into account the audience's knowledge. If their audiences are seen to be knowledgeable about an object, such as Ben about Gary, they tend to use a brief label of the object. For a less knowledgeable audience, they use more descriptive words, like a friend of mine, to help the audience understand the utterances. So language use is a cooperative activity, but how do we coordinate our language use in a conversational setting? To be sure, we have a conversation in small groups. The number of people engaging in a conversation at a time is rarely more than four. By some counts, more than 90% of conversations happen in a group of four individuals or less. Certainly, coordinating conversation among four is not as difficult as coordinating conversation among 10. But even among only four people, if you think about it, everyday conversation is almost as miraculous achievement. We typically have a conversation by rapidly exchanging words and utterances in real time in a noisy environment. Think about your conversation at home in the morning, at a bus stop, in a shopping mall. How can we keep track of our common ground under such circumstances? Coordinating language use by audience design. In systematic research on audience design, Fussell and Cross found that when communicating about public figures, speakers included more descriptive information. Examples are physical appearances, occupation. About lesser known and less identifiable people. For example, Kevin Klein. Then better known ones, Woody Allen, Clint Eastwood, so that their listeners can identify who they are talking about. Likewise, Isaacs and Clark in 1987 showed that people who were familiar with New York City could gouge their audience's familiarity with New York City soon after they began a conversation and adjusted their descriptions of landmarks to help the audience identify such landmarks as the Brooklyn Bridge and Yankee Stadium more easily. More generally, Grice suggested that speakers often follow certain rules, which he calls conversational maxims, by trying to be informative, maximum of quantity, truthful, maximum of quality, relevant, maximum of relation, and clear and un unambiguous maximum of manner. Pickering and Garrett, in 2004 argued that we achieve our conversational coordination by virtue of our ability to interactively align each other's actions at different levels of language use. Lexicon, words and expression, syntax, grammatical rules for arranging words and expressions together, as well as speech rate and accent. For instance, when one person uses a certain expression to refer to an object in a conversation, others tend to use the same expression. Furthermore, if someone says the cowboy offered a banana to the robber rather than the cowboy offered the robber a banana, 
others were more likely to use the same syntactic structure. For example, the girl gave a book to the boy rather than the girl gave the boy a book. Even if different words are involved. Hmm. Finally, people in conversation tend to exhibit similar accents and rates of speech, and they are often associated with people's social identity. So if you have lived in different places where people have somewhat different accents, for example, the United States and the United Kingdom, you might have noticed that you speak with Americans with an American accent, but speak with Britons with a British accent. Oh, thank goodness. Here, I thought it was just me. I always pick up on people's accents and, well, sometimes it gets embarrassing. <laughs> Pickering and Garrett suggest that these interpersonal alignments at different levels of language use can activate similar situation models in the minds of those who are engaged in a conversation. Situation models are representations about the topic of a conversation. So if you are talking about Gary and Mary with your friends, you might have a situation model of Gary giving Mary a ring in your mind. Pickering and Garrett's theory is that as you describe this situation using language, others in the conversation to begin, begin to use similar words and grammar, and many other aspects of language use converge. As you all do so, similar situation models begin to build in everyone's mind through the mechanism known as priming. Priming occurs when you're thinking about one concept, for example, a ring, reminds you about another related concept, for example, marriage. So if everyone in the conversation knows about Gary, Mary, and the usual course of events associated with a ring, engagement, wedding, marriage, etc., everyone is likely to construct a shared situation model about Gary and Mary, thus making use of our highly developed interpersonal ability to imitate i.e. executing the same action as another person, and cognitive ability to infer, i.e. one idea leading to another idea, we humans coordinate our common ground, share situation models, and communicate with each other. What do we talk about? What are humans doing when we are talking? Surely we can communicate about mundane things, such as what to have for dinner, but also more complex and abstract things, such as the meaning of life and death, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and many other philosophical thoughts. Well, when natural occurring conversations were actually observed, a staggering 60 to 70% of everyday conversations for both men and women turned out to be gossip. People talk about themselves and others whom they know. <laughs> there you go. Just like Adam and Ben, more often than not, people use language to communicate about their social world. Yes, as humans, we love to gossip, don't we? Gossip may sound trivial and seem to belittle our noble ability for language. Surely, one of the most remarkable human abilities of all of that distinguish us from other animals. Au contraire, some have argued that gossip, activities to think and communicate about our social world, is one of the most critical uses to which language has been put. Dunbar in 1996 conjectured that gossiping is the human equivalent of grooming, monkeys and primates attending to each other by cleaning each other's fur. He argues that it is an act of socializing, signaling the importance of one's partner. Furthermore, by gossiping, humans can communicate and share their representations about their social world, who their friends are, and enemies, <laughs> what the right thing to do is under what circumstance, and so on. In so doing, they can regulate their social world, making more friends and enlarging one's own group, often called the in-group, the group to which one belongs against the other groups, out groups, that are more likely to be one's enemies. Dunbar has argued that it is these social effects that have given humans an evolutionary advantage and larger brains which in turn help humans to think more complex and abstract thoughts, and more important, maintain larger in-groups. Dunbar estimated an equation that predicts average group size of non-human primate genera from the average neocortex size, the part of the brain that supports higher order in cognition. In line with this, social brain hypotheses, Dunbar showed that those primate genera 
that have larger brains tend to live in larger groups. Furthermore, using the same equation, he was able to estimate the group size that human brains can support, which turned out to be about 150. Hmm, approximately the size of modern hunt and gatherer communities. Dunbar's argument is that language, brain, and human group living have co evolved. Language and human sociality are inseparable. Dunbar's hypothesis is controversial. Nonetheless, whether or not he is right, our everyday language use often ends up maintaining the existing structure of intergroup relationships. Language use can have implications for how we construe our social world. For one thing, there are subtle cues that people use to convey the extent to which someone's action is just a special case in a particular context or a pattern that occurs across many contexts and more like a character trait of the person. According to Semin and Fiedler in 1988, someone's action can be described by an action verb that describes a concrete action. He runs. A state verb that describes the actor's psychological state. He likes running. An adjective that describes the actor's personality. He is athletic. Or a noun that describes the actor's role. He is an athlete. Depending on whether a verb or an adjective or noun is used, speakers can convey the permanency and stability of an actor's tendency to act in certain ways. Verbs convey particularly where adjectives convey permanency. Intriguingly, people will tend to describe positive actions of their in-group members using adjectives. He is generous rather than verbs. He gave a blind man some change and negative actions of outgroup members using adjectives. He is cruel, rather than verbs. He kicked a dog. This is called a linguistic intergroup bias, which can produce and reproduce the representation of intergroup relationships by painting a picture favoring the in-group. That is, in-group members are typically good, and if they do anything bad, that's more than an exception in special circumstances. In contrast, outgroup members are typically bad, and if they do anything good, that's more an exception. Hmm. So are you uh, part of the in-group or what? <laughs> so funny. In addition, when people exchange their gossip, it can spread through broader social networks. If gossip is transmitted from one person to another, the second person can transmit it to a third person who then in turn transmit it to a fourth and so on through the chain of communication. This often happens for emotive stories. If gossip is repeatedly transmitted and spread, it can reach a large number of people. When stories travel through communication change, they tend to become conventionalized. A Native American tale of the War of the Ghost recounts a warrior's encounter with ghosts traveling in canoes and his involvement with their ghostly battle. He is shot by an arrow, but doesn't die, returning home to tell the tale. After his narration, however, he becomes still. A black thing comes out of his mouth, and he eventually dies. When it was told to a student in England in the 1920s and retold from memory to another person, who in turn retold it to another, and so on, in a communication chain, the mythic tale became a story of a young warrior going to a battlefield in which canoes became boats and the black thing that came out of his mouth became simply his spirit. In other words, information transmitted multiple times was transformed to something that was easily understood by many. That is, information was assimilated into the common ground shared by most people in the linguistic community. More recently, Kashima in 2000 conducted a similar experiment using a story that contained a sequence of events that described a young couple's interaction that included both stereotypical and counter-stereotypical actions. For example, a man watching sports on TV on Sundays versus a man vacuuming the house. Oh, that sounds like a perfect world. <laughs> After the retelling of the story, much of the counter-stereotypical information was dropped and stereotypical information was more likely to be retained. Because stereotypes are part of the common ground shared by the community, this finding, too, suggests that conversational retelling are likely to reproduce conventional content. So they have a little box here that talks about emotion and talk. 
People tend to tell stories that evoke strong emotions. Such emotive stories can then spread far and wide through people's social networks. When a group of 33 psychology students visited a city morgue, no doubt an emotive experience for many, yeah, quite emotional, they told their experience to about six people on average. Each of these people who heard about it told one person, who in turn told another person on average. By this third retelling of the morgue visit, 881 people had heard about this in their community within 10 days. If everyone in society is connected with one another by six degrees of separation, and if a chain letter can travel hundreds of steps via the internet, the possibility of emotive gossip traveling through a vast social network is not a fantasy. Indeed, urban legends that evoke strong feelings of disgust tend to spread into cyberspace and become more prevalent on the internet. Psychological Consequences of Language Use What are the psychological consequences of language use? When people use language to describe an experience, their thoughts and feelings are profoundly shaped by the linguistic representation that they have produced rather than the original experience per se. For example, Halberstadt in 2003 showed a picture of a person displaying an ambiguous emotion and examined how people evaluated the displayed emotion. When people verbally explained why the target person was expressing a particular emotion, they tended to remember the person as feeling that emotion more intensely than when they simply labeled the emotion. Thus constructing a linguistic representation of another person's emotion apparently biased the speaker's memory of the person's emotion. Furthermore, linguistically labeling one's own emotional experience appears to alter the speaker's neural processes. When people linguistically label negative images, the amygdala, a brain structure that is critically involved in processing of negative emotions such as fear, was activated less than when they were not given a chance to label them. Potentially because of these effects of verbalizing emotional experiences, linguistic reconstructions of negative life events can have some therapeutic effects on those who suffer from the traumatic experience. In 2006, it was found that writing and talking about negative past life events improved people's psychological well-being, but just thinking about them worsened it. There are many other examples of effects of language use on memory and decision making. I've even heard of people who get frustrated maybe at, at work or with a coworker and, they, and they're mad, but they know they can't get mad at work. So they'll go home, they'll write it down. It's like, I'm so angry at that person, et cetera. And then they'll burn it and it's gone, poof, left behind. Something to think about. <laughs> Furthermore, if a certain type of language use, linguistic practice, is repeated by a large number of people in a community, it can potentially have a significant effect on their thoughts and actions. This notion is often called Sapir-Whorf hypotheses. Yes, those were Sapir and Whorf were the, the researchers. For instance, if you are given a description of a man, Stephen, as having greater than average experience of the world, you know, well-traveled, very job experience, a strong family orientation and well-developed social skills. How do you describe Stephen? Do you think you can remember Stephen's personality five days later? It will probably be difficult. But if you know Chinese and are reading about Stephen in Chinese, as Hoffman, Lau, and Johnson did in 1986, the chances are that you can remember him well. This is because English does not have a word to describe this kind of personality, whereas Chinese does, shi gu. This way, the language you use can influence your cognition. In its strong form, it has been argued that language determines thought, but this is probably wrong. Language does not completely determine our thoughts. Our thoughts are far too flexible for that but habitual use of language can influence our habit of thought and action. For instance, some linguistic practice seems to be associated even with cultural values and social institution. Pronoun drop is the case in point. Pronouns such as I and you are used to represent the speaker and listener of a speech in English. In an English sentence, these pronouns cannot be dropped if they are used as the subject of a sentence. 
So for instance, I went to the movie last night. It's fine. But went to the movie last night is not a standard English. However, in other languages, such as Japanese, pronouns can be, and in fact are often dropped, dropped from sentences. It turned out that people living in those countries where pronoun drop languages are spoken tend to have more collectivistic values. For example, employees having greater loyalty towards their employers than those who use non-pronoun drop languages such as English. It was argued that the explicit reference to you and I may remind speakers the distinction between self and other and the differentiation between individuals. Such a linguistic practice may act as a constant reminder of the cultural value, which in turn may encourage people to perform the linguistic practice. So let's look at an example of evidence for Sapir Whorf's hypotheses, which comes from a comparison between English and Mandarin Chinese speakers. In English, time is often metaphorically described in horizontal terms. For instance, good times are ahead of us. Our hardship can be left behind us. We can move a meeting forward or backward. Mandarin Chinese speakers use similar horizontal metaphors too, but also use vertical metaphors. So for instance, the last month is called Shangi Yu or above month, and the next month Zaigi Yu or below month. I don't really speak Mandarin, so I do apologize if I'm pronouncing these incorrectly. To put it differently, the arrow of time flies horizontally in English, but it can fly both horizontally and vertically in Chinese. Does this difference in language use affect English and Chinese speakers' comprehension of language? This is what Borodisky found. First, English and Chinese speakers' understanding of sentences that use horizontal, June comes before August, did not differ very much. When they were first presented with a picture that implies a horizontal positioning, the black worm is ahead and the white worm, they could read and understand them faster than when they were presented with a picture that implies a vertical positioning. Example, the black ball is above the white ball. This implies that thinking about the horizontal positioning, ahead or behind, equally primed, reminded, both English and Chinese speakers of the horizontal metaphor used in the sentence about time. However, English and Chinese speakers' comprehension differed for statements that do not use spatial metaphors such as August is later than June. When primed with the vertical spatial positioning, Chinese speakers comprehended these statements faster, but English speakers more slowly than when they were primed with the horizontal spatial positioning. Apparently, English speakers were not used to thinking about months in terms of the vertical line, above or below. Indeed, when they were trained to do so, their comprehension was similar to Chinese speakers. Hmm, well, that is fascinating. I like that. In conclusion, language and language use constitute a central ingredient of human psychology. Language is an essential tool that enables us to live the kind of life we do. Can you imagine a world in which machines are built, farms are cultivated, and goods and services are transported to our household without language? Is it possible for us to make laws and regulations, negotiate contracts, and enforce agreements and settle disputes without talking? Much of the contemporary human civilization wouldn't have been possible without the human ability to develop and use language. Like the Tower of Babel, language can divide humanity, and yet the core of humanity includes the innate ability for language use. Whether we can use it wisely is a task before us in this globalized world. Well, I really enjoyed chapter 34 from the week six at Queen's University Psych 100 course, and I learned something new about language. And some different research about it. So that was kind of fun. And it was really fascinating, the differences in culture and languages. It, it always surprises me, even though I kind of know it already, right? So make sure to put something in the comments, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the show, or share it with someone you know. It's always greatly appreciated as we join this big, huge community online. I'll see you in the next chapter, because you deserve to pass this course you deserve to learn and become the scientist that you are, and you deserve to live a more inspired life.